Hello and welcome to a site called the Guardian of Petra. This is called Wadi Musa as well. Wadi means valley and Musa is Moses. So we're in the Valley of Moses. And this valley is the one that goes all the way down into the ancient city of Petra. We've seen some of it, we'll see more of it as we continue on our pilgrimage of freedom. And we're here in this Guardian of Petra because from these rocks where we are standing, right next to the road, which goes down into the Wadi and takes them into that ancient city, is a spring. And this spring is called the Spring of Moses, giving the name not only to the Wadi, but also to this city right behind us, a small village called the Wadi Musa. The spring is the guardian because there's so much water that comes from it that even the ancient Nabataeans channeled that water into their city and made it a marvelous and life-giving place in the middle of the desert. So you might think, okay, well, there's springs in a lot of places. What makes this so um, particular? Well, we have to remember what happened in Numbers 20. The Israelites were leaving Egypt. They were in their desert journey. They were looking for a way into the Holy Land. They asked the Edomites if they could come through. You can read all about that in Numbers. They said, no way, Moses said, Please just let us walk down the highway, the King's Highway, which is a place we'll take, we'll share certainly some of those images with you. And that highway was so secure that even the ancient kings would take it. It wasn't just a trade route. But anyway, so they said, we will walk the highway. We will pay for the water. Please let us come through. And they said, no, 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 no. And so that's all spoken about in Numbers 20. And so Moses and Aaron were in this place and there were so many events that happened the first one being that Miriam died. Now Miriam, she was at a really important um, point of reference for the people. And there's an ancient Jewish tradition that says that the rock from which water sprang forth, remember we were in Rephidim in Sinai? Well, that rock was something they carried with them, but it stopped giving water when Miriam passed away. And so suddenly there was an issue here with the people. And so let's read about that conversation. Let's talk about what happened and how it points to the seventh commandment and our journey, our pilgrimage of freedom. So follow me down underneath this place. You see the domes behind us that covers the spring, the Wadi Musa. They covered it probably oof, 50 years ago to keep it clean and to keep it sacred because people, local people still go in there. They still use the abundant water that flows from it. You can see the fig trees behind me growing. You can see, well, I can see a beautiful vin, a vine, really old grapevine in front of us. It's a fruitful place and a place of life. So let's go see the weird rock that's associated with the spring and where the water came out and talk about the seventh commandment. Let's go. We've come inside this very interesting building. As I said, we're right on the road, so you can hear the traffic coming in as all the people go down into the Wadi Musa. And it's an echo chamber in here, but it does keep this spring flowing. And it's amazing to me to see how much water is just coming out of this rock constantly. Uh, even now, we saw a person come in with their plastic big bottles of, or not bottles, they were huge containers, to be filled with the spring water to take home with them. So I decided, however, to sit on this very strange rock. And our guide pointed out that this rock is actually volcanic rock. It's very different than the sandstone um, cliff sides that go down into the Wadi Musa. And he says it's interesting that uh, people saw that the water was coming from here. It's almost as if something um, from out of this world, in a way, is the instrument, in a way, that this water would come to them. And so that's why I think they also kept it here in a special way and didn't cover it up with the pavement like the rest of this place. But let's remember what happened and why this is so important for the Exodus journey. Of course, coming through the desert, we need water desperately. They needed water. And as I mentioned outside, Miriam had passed away. And it says the people stayed there 
and she was buried, and then the community had no water. So that's why you've got that tradition that somehow she was connected with this. But this is the key. These are the people who are being freed from within and outside. It says the community had no water, and so they held an assembly against Moses and Aaron. The people quarreled with Moses, exclaiming, listen to this, just listen to what they say. Would that we had perished in our kin with our kindred when they perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the Lord's assembly into the wilderness for us and our livestock to die here? And then they continue. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt only to bring us to this wretched place? It's not a place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates. And here there is no water to drink. The most remarkable thing is that's what you see outside now. All of those things grow right here. But anyway, so what happened? Moses and Aaron went away from the assembly and went to pray. And it was there that the Lord gave them very specific instructions. Now, this might sound similar to what happened in um, Rephidim when we talked about this, but a lot of the scholars and, well, biblical scholars say that, well, Meribah and Massa in the desert, is it the same place? Is it two places? Were they two different time frames? Nobody's really 100% sure. But what they do see is that this, um, this place here is known as Meribah and Massa in the desert, as Rephidim, Meribah and Massa in the desert. And so there's one in particular, well, several scholars in particular who say, this was an ongoing process of freedom. This was an ongoing process of getting Egypt out of our hearts and really following the Lord in covenant. And so that's why I think it's pertinent right here where there's such a tradition that this is the spring of Moses to talk about our continuing pilgrimage of freedom. So th what happens? What does the Lord tell them? Well, he says, take the staff, assemble the community, and you and Aaron, your brother, in their presence, will speak to the rock so that it yield its waters. Therefore, you'll bring forth water from the rock for them, for the community and their livestock. And so Moses took the staff from its place. Remember, it's in the Ark of the Covenant as he was ordered. And then you can imagine around this area, this dry riverbed, the whole assembly, very angry, was together. And everybody was really thirsty. They were irritated that Miriam died. Probably Aaron and Moses were also very upset. I mean, this is all family, right? Miriam was the one that saved Moses' life. And so this is what happens. Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him. And then Moses and Aaron together uh, gathered the assembly before the rock, perhaps right in this very place. And he said to them, listen to what Moses says. Here now, you rebels, shall we bring forth water from you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their livestock did as well. Very interesting. There's some details there that are really important. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because, listen to the response, so we, we can't lose the details. Because you did not believe in me, to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. Neither you nor Aaron. What? What are you talking about? Why was he so upset? Why was the punishment so severe? I mean, these were the two leaders that were bringing them all the way through this process, bringing them again and again to look up to the Lord, to trust in the Lord, the instrument of the covenant. So Moses' main problem was that he failed to trust in God. It wasn't that he misinterpreted God. He was actually showing the people, the assembly, the entire assembly, a different God than the one that took them out of Egypt, a different one than was reaffirmed time and again. What does that mean? That's a huge problem. It was the same problem that happened with Aaron when he was with the golden calf, okay? Isn't the God that's been revealed? And this is the God they had to have so clear when they went into the promised land. So Moses was utterly rejecting God and trying to take control, okay? 
Many people say that he was violent. Why did you have to strike the rock? Well, if you ask anybody around here, sometimes in these wadis uh, from water that washes through, and there'll be um, sort of a stream or a pool of water behind a rock. So you want to you know, move the rocks out of the way so that water can be freed. Mm, interesting. It certainly wasn't the case here because water is still coming out. But what's really happening is Moses is trying to usurp God's place. Look at the text. Shall we bring the water, me, for you out of this rock? Me. It's all about me, me and the staff here. The emphasis is important. God will bring water out of the rock for you. But he and Aaron said, we'll do it. We'll do it for you. So God's place is usurped. Rather than he will doing, he would do it. And so this is interesting that in verse 12, um, that's when God accuses him and says, because you did not believe in me. Wow. So faith. He's actually showing us the pathway to freedom, which is faith. So Moses totally failed to trust God for this life supplying water, took things into his own hands. And because he was supposed to be the leader and know what to do, he says, I can do this. Let's just get the rocks out of the way. God was like, are you kidding me? Well, I don't know if the Lord said that, but he was surprised. Now, the other thing that God tells Moses when what we just read, and this would be number, or excuse me, Exodus 17, this is the first time in Rephidim when he was asking for the water, you know, for the people. He says, behold, I will stand before you on the rock here at Horeb. This is the Lord saying, I will stand before you before the assembly on the rock at Horeb. The assembly were also really angry. They were complaining against them both, well, Moses in particular, because they didn't have water. And so God said, I'll do it. I will be the one who's being judged here. I will do it. And then the water came forth so that the people could drink. So it's an astonishing statement, actually, that the trial that God uh, lives through, the place that he is accused, is standing on a rock. Of course, we know that in Corinthians, St. Paul talks about Jesus himself is the rock. He was crucified on the rock. He was condemned to death after being judged on the rock. And so it's almost like a foreshadowing of what he does for us standing before the assembly. And so God has provided in the past and he will provide again. But you, in fact, it's interesting. When Moses comes and said, don't just speak to, he, the Lord told Moses, speak to me. Talk to the rock and the water will come out. Speak, speak. He didn't speak. He hid it. It's almost as if he is judging. He is judging the Lord. All you had to do was ask. And so it's almost like this subtle pedagogical way that God is telling his people, hey, I'm here. Just ask. Just ask. But Moses says, no, it's not going to work, and I'll do it. One of the things I also wanted to mention, if you take a, a look at Jeremiah 17, this is what the Lord says. This is really interesting. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Okay. The one who trusts in man. Moses was trusting in himself. And in that, it's very interesting. He seems to be bringing a curse upon himself and a curse upon the people. And you're like, oh my gosh. It's exactly what Jeremiah says. That's a problem if you're really trying to bring the people into freedom. So this is why I wanted to actually talk about the seventh commandment here, which is so important for Christians in this time. Well, what is the seventh commandment? Well, very clearly it says, Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, you shall not steal. Okay, you shall not steal. What does it have to do with this entire episode? We'll see in just a second. Stealing means taking or keeping uh, your neighbor's goods. That's just the simple definition. Or wronging him with respect to his goods. You know, you think about vandalism or kind of taking something and using it without uh, the okay. Charity and justice is the basis of the common good. In fact, this um, particular commandment talks about the common good, something which is for everyone. This particular well, as you've seen, people are coming in all the time. It's not private property. I love the fact that it's for everybody, and that's the whole point. We cannot usurp the power to bring it forth. We cannot usurp it just for ourselves. And this is part of what this commandment addresses. God ordered through this commandment charity and justice. So let's go back quickly. The first covenant, Genesis 1. The Lord said, let them have dominion over the earth. Let them have it, because I give it to you. We're created in his image and likeness. We know that. 
And so therefore the whole world is destined for every single person, is to serve each person and to assure, this is very interesting, and this is part of the commandment, is to assure security. Because um, people can be endangered by violence, by poverty, and so not stealing secures, assures that they will have security. And also it's a guarantee of people's dignity and their freedom. When you have a source of water, when you have this that's for everyone, you actually are much more free. And so this is a reality of the commandment. But also a result of this is their solidarity that's created. When the Lord's trying to bring this people together in covenant, he wants that solidarity to be a reality. Now, another thing, if you're talking about justice and charity, I love this about some businesses in particular, businessmen, um, fulfilling this commandment, it's not like they're stealing from people, but they're actually creating goods for others. Like, they're creating more jobs, they're creating a more just environment. All of this is part of this commandment. So, owning means and being a steward of God's providence, that's what they're doing. Because when we're talking about goods, it's not just like physical goods, like water. It's actually property. It's skills, like artistic skills, practical skills. I suppose that's why copyrights are such a good thing. It's like I can't just use Matt Maher's music without his okay. That would be stealing from him. That would be breaking this commandment. But I'm going to give him the credit because that's injustice and in charity. Or factories. All of these things are goods. And therefore, there's an obligation to employ them to use these goods in ways to benefit the greatest numbers of people. That's why I love Matt, because he's always like, please use the music for your pilgrimages. I'm happy to share it because he has such a, a heart for everyone. So if you really wanna save the world, you really wanna to touch people's live, lives uh, and give to someone concretely, do this, do this, share those goods. So secondly, as a, a point or a kind of a explanation of this commandment, um, there is this really strong connection between goods and human dignity. It's really easy to think about um, Scrooge, right, and Mr. Cratchit, okay? There's a real big difference there. What's, what are the goods doing in their lives? One of them lived temperance, which means to moderate attachment to worldly goods. One of them really, well, uh, Scrooge learned to live justice, which is to give each person their due. Okay, and then of course solidarity was when there's a union that's brought together. And isn't it beautiful that at the very end, Scrooge was brought to um, generosity. This is what happens when you live the commandment. But if you look even at our um, faith and the example of Christ who brought this to completion, it says in 2 Corinthians, he became poor that you might become rich. That's how we are to live this. That's how we are to live this. So unjustly taking goods of another, unjust wages, for example, use of common goods for private purposes. You know, you're in charge of the government, therefore this property suddenly becomes mine. Work poorly done, vandalism, tax evasion, forgery. Those are all things that go against this commandment, but they also require reparation, which is kind of easier when we're talking about a good. So therefore, honor your promises and the contracts. This is all part of good faith. Commitments to others, this is a significant part of economic life because it touches on the goods of people, right? Um, and it's based on the rights and the dignity of each person. So what about stolen objects? Clearly, that's the easiest thing where we can apply this commandment. But what's interesting is it's an injustice in what is created. It's an injustice in what is created because it doesn't belong to me. So restitution of stolen goods to the owner or the equivalent is what needs to happen there. And I love the example of Zacchaeus. You climbed that tree, was touched by the Lord, and he said, if I have taken anything unjustly, I will restore it four times over. Okay, so I remember the first thing I stole when I was a kid. I loved this rock. A rock, I stole a rock, okay. But it was a piece, a beautiful piece of fool's gold that a neighborhood kid had on their back fence. And my mother, when I brought it in and showed it to her, she said, so where did you get that, honey? And I said, oh, just saw it on a fence. And so my brother, my big brother, told the story. And my mother made me take that, it was a rock, okay? Take the rock back, go down the alleyway crying so that I could give it back to the person and ask uh, and say sorry. And then we ended up giving them um, what we used to collect were pieces of agate, a beautiful stone, honey, honey sandwich agate, we called it because it was so pretty. Restitution, 
My mother taught me what it means to take something which isn't mine and then to make restitution for it. And this is all part of that. I didn't realize I was a little Zacchaeus when I was a kid. So other things that are just evident, gambling, okay, especially when you're depriving others of something good, especially when they're people who um, become so addicted to this that they can't take care of their families. It happens so much. It's a type of enslavement. So these are all really important things when we're talking about this commandment. And we'll go into it a little bit further. But what I wanted to do as we end is just to invite you again to take out your personal Ten Commandments. We're on that second tablet. And just make a reflection. What is it that the Lord is asking me to do to live this better, the Seventh Commandment? For example, what goods of production do I have? And I, am I employing them or using them for the highest benefit or for the greatest number of people to benefit from? Don't build all those bins. You know, you've got a great harvest, so tear down my bins, build more, and then I don't have to do anything. No, no, no. That's not what the Lord wants. Another thing might be, did I ask or do I seek financial or other gain at the detriment of others? Have I done that, even in the smallest things? And if I've, I've excuse me, even if I've taken something, what type of reparations have I given? So I think it's a beautiful reflection that we need to make during this Lent as we make our pilgrimage into freedom and how our Lord wants to free us from the slavery to goods and being kind of, um, you know, chained by them. So know that here in this place where there's so much life-giving water and where Moses and Aaron didn't exactly give the true face of God, we're praying for you that you get to know him and his true face and his goodness and you, com you communicate that goodness to everyone else. And so we hope you can join us again tomorrow and God bless you.